coming in. Thanks for attending the um, third in our series of Farms of the Future Breakfast webinar series. Uh, this, this event will be focusing on uh, suppliers and, and technology. And in lieu of the fact of having face-to-face uh, -face field days and running a little trade show session, we're going to have um, three panel sessions with uh, nine suppliers. So if, um, Kyle, if you could jump to the next slide. So the idea is we'll get uh, each supplier to do a, a quick five minute presentation, um, three in a group, and then we'll have a Q and A after that. So after each, each panel session of three suppliers, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions through the chat. Uh, we've got three sessions of those, which is great. And then I'm gonna introduce you to some of the tools. Uh, to kick off uh, this morning's presentation, we're going to have um, Darren Price from Price Rural Management. For those who weren't in the first webinar event, uh, Darren uh, worked at uh, Kawula and worked with the uh, MLA on, on their ag tech site and has a, a great um, lot of experience around uh, ag tech and choosing ag tech. Uh, so Darren's going to give us some of his insights into to choosing technology and, and where to kick off that ag tech journey, which is great. So thanks, Darren, I appreciate uh, your time on that. Um, so we've got a few participants in the room now, so we'll jump onto the next slide, Kyle, if you just wanna give a quick overview on Zoom um, and then um, I'll introduce Darren. Yeah, sure. So welcome back to all those that have been on the previous sessions. You probably know how this all works, but um, welcome to anyone who's new. So just to confirm, we are recording this. Um, I don't believe we have any videos, but if you are having some problems with bandwidth, just turn your camera off. It might just make it a little smoother. Um, if you can keep yourselves on mute, which is the bottom left, you'll find your mute button. Um, unless you're a presenter, we'd like to hear you. Uh, there will be Q&A sessions that uh, Scott's just mentioned. So we will ask that you um, put those questions into the chat. So you'll see down the bottom, you have an option to open the chat and you can yeah, type in questions there. If you have any other questions or tech issues or anything, just put it in there and we'll, we'll respond to you. Um, I think that's about all at the moment. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Carly. If you want to jump to the next slide. And if we could spotlight Darren, that'd be great. Uh, morning, Darren, how are you? Well, thanks, Scott. That's great. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. So, um, yeah, Darren, um, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, it'll be great to hear some of your insights from your experience on, I suppose, both sides of the ag tech fence, from uh, being on the customer side and now on the um, management side. So um, over to you. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. Um, Scott and his team have asked me to have a quick chat to you this morning about prioritising your digital roadmap and um, how you might uh, go about the uh, process of selecting some digital technology for your business. Um, and this is just based on my experience over the last couple of years in uh, projects, but also personally. Um, and sort of sitting in all different areas of, of, the, uh, of the whole spectrum. So um, next slide, please, Kylie. Um, I guess the first part is, is your road map basics. So what are your greatest pain points? These, these are the things that you need to address first up to understand that um, you're putting a piece of digital technology in for a reason. Um, it's fine to say, well, let's put something in and try it out. Um, but the reality is if you're doing this for, for a business outcome, um, you want to specify what you're putting in and why. So um, one of the hardest things to do is actually to identify a, a pain point. Being farmers, we just go and deal with stuff that's broken down or going wrong. We don't really think of it uh, as a particular pain, but when you really sit down and analyze it, you'll find that it is. So identify your areas of greatest concern, the issues that you find tedious, time consuming, costly. Um, establish what you want to measure and why in that space. So um, that, that's the greatest thing here is you want to know what you're trying to really measure and why you're specifically wanting to do that. And then third, 
probably most difficult part of this whole whole process to begin with is considering a budget that you're prepared to spend. So um, this stuff can come along cheaply, but also um, the, the better end of the gear probably is going to cost you a, a reasonable sum. So consider all of that to start with. Um, you might wish to think about the, what we call the low hanging fruit. Um, rain, we've been measuring our rain forever. You know, properties have got 100 and, you know, 50 plus years of rainfall data. Um, so it's something we do constantly and, and we build some understanding of our businesses and our country through that. Um, weather has sound use cases, you know, particularly in cropping or, 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 or horticultural pursuits um, um, around spraying, but, but also just from, you know, WHS management at a base end for, for a livestock business potentially. And water, water is a pretty mature sort of solution space today, and it offers a lot of peace of mind and time saving um, and, and remote understanding, as we've heard in the last session with, with, with a couple of the producers that are involved in this particular trial. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, solid stuff around water as well. So uh, those are probably some of the low hanging fruit that I identify with most people. Um, you may have, have different ideas. Um, next slide, please, Kylie. So the next step, of course, is the research. So work really hard on that, and it will be hard work. Um, you know, it, it might be as simple as, as Google searches or internet searching, um, field days either in person or virtually as we do today. Um, but, but keep looking, solutions will turn up. Um, one of the producers last session mentioned the fact that, you know, um, he was surprised how things did turn up eventually. Um, but what you're looking for in the base end of this is where are the businesses situated? Um, are they Australian? Are they from different countries? Um, because you've got to be aware that you'll need after sales service and support. And so be, be mindful of the fact that if you don't speak Spanish, you probably don't want to buy something from Spain. But um, you know, there's lots of really, really good um, tech out there based in Australia, but also overseas that's easily accessible. Um, quiz out how long they've been doing this as a business, how many units have they sold or installed. Um, still seeing a lot of hype out there that, you know, people are promoting or businesses are promoting products, but they're, they're really not actually anywhere near commercial or have the ability to deliver on any scale or to any maturity. Um, consider the, the connectivity offerings that go with the solutions. Um, you know, if, if it's a, an absolute three or four G requirement and you don't live anywhere that you have that ability to, to connect to that, it's probably not the right solution. So consider all of those connectivity offerings that go with solutions and what they entail. Think about whether or not you may wish to scale up with other devices in the future and hang off this particular device you're beginning with, because you know you might really enjoy your first foray into digital tech and say, I wanna move into you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, is this particular company and this connectivity space going to enable me to, to do that easily? Um, use your personal network um, of, of bit like, like-minded businesses uh, that you know that have used digital technology and, and get some validation from them. We always do that in many, many ways in the agricultural business, uh, and this should be no different. And then finally, the other tip here is to try and understand the language and dialogue around digital technology. And it's, uh, it, it can be a tricky one, um, that there's lots of terms and acronyms that uh, you know, I find still confusing on occasion. Um, so try and get a bit of a, a, an understanding or a glossary of terms from somewhere so you understand what you're reading or hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the key points to consider, um, you know, is this a supply and in-store purchase that you're making? Is it out of the box um, and, and they, they simply come along and put it in? for you or are you needing to contribute in some way shape or form and if you do um, 
need to install this yourself? You know, what is your capability and uh, level in terms of doing this? Uh, how much time do you have? Um, do you have a bit of a technical understanding? Some of this stuff having installed for particular businesses uh, in, in the last six months can be a little bit more challenging than it appears. So um, try and understand those sort of uh, areas of, of the whole you know, digital uh, landscape. Um, some people just like to turn the telly on and watch Foxtel when it's hooked up. And, you know, look, I'm a bit like that sometimes. But equally, there's plenty of people that are highly capable to, to engineer a tower or, or, or whatever and go ahead and, and put stuff in as well. So it really just depends on your individual um, position to that. Um, find out what the dashboard or app looks like. Is there one? Some businesses have supplied a device but have no uh, support network behind it to display your data. So make sure that there's something and what does it look like um, when it comes up? What's the data that comes through and what does it look like so that you know what you're going to see and get? Um, understand again, the connectivity re requirements. Um, do you need towers? How big are they? How many do you need? Um, what's the power requirements? Those sort of questions should be very transparent when uh, answers to those should be transparent when you, you approach a supplier. Um, but just make sure that you know that and then check out the hidden costs. See if you can uncover if there are any hidden costs down the track. You know, does the solar panel, for example, need to be replaced every three years or, or something like that? It shouldn't, but you just never know. So, so have a look at that. Battery life's another good one. Uh, next slide, please. So I guess my final thoughts here, um, uh, uh, be prepared to have a realistic budget cheapest um, does, rarely delivers uh, to your expectation. Um, and, and there is a, a range of pricing on, on a number of devices that I see across the, the landscape. So, um, you know, you don't want to become uh, a slave to, to your CapEx budget or your OpEx budget in this space to begin with. So, so just have a, a realistic budget in mind and work towards that. Uh, and remember, it's not always just the setup costs, but it can be ongoing costs for data and maintenance. Um, you, you know, you won't get this stuff uh, in, in the first instance for an ongoing term in terms of data delivery, um, but there'll be a cost to all that. Um, don't forget or underestimate the need for guarding. As you can see in this photo next to you there, uh, a tree garden three steel post does not necessarily make a livestock proof guard. Um, these things can be brittle, they can be broken and, and guarding is a big one on my list of things that need to, to be considered um, up front. Um, don't overdo the number of installations in, in the initial phase. Um, smart farm pilots like we've seen with multiple suppliers and multiple devices is a really complicated space. And if you're not, um, well into this journey in your business, I wouldn't consider going and putting in so many uh, installations as you've seen in these projects. But um, equally, I just wouldn't go with one necessarily and stop at that. Um, and it may be worth seeking some assistance from advisors uh, of independent um, uh, space, um, such as you know Scott and his team or, or, or people like myself in, in, in consultancy, uh, who have been down this, this road and, and discovered a few things that maybe are not completely apparent to start with. So they would be uh, all of my advice in terms of, uh, of the fundamentals of, de of selecting devices and, and digital tech in your business. Uh, it's a great journey. There's, there's a lot of payback and use case, but it's about identifying the most applicable in your circumstance to begin with. Thanks, Scott. Great, Darren. Thanks for that. That's uh, some great insights. And yeah, I think I'd have to um, agree with you on the guarding issue. Um, I've seen sheep damage to weather stations and we had um, a fair bit of hair damage or you think or wallaby damage in one of the vineyards to some soil moisture sensors. And uh, it's amazing what a bird can do to a solar panel and um, cover it so it's completely ineffective. Um, yeah. So if anyone's got any questions for Darren, that'd be great. Just um, put them into the chat. 
but I've just got a quick one. As as a farmer, you, you did mention the the hype around ag tech. But as a as a farmer, what sort of questions should they be asking suppliers so that to help them um, determine where suppliers are positioned and the technology that they're they're promoting is positioned in that in that hype curve? Um, I, I guess you know it depends on the, on the, the digital tech they're looking for, but let let's pick something like a weather station. Well. Um, you're not going to buy multiples of those. So it's not a question of how many have you sold necessarily or how many can you supply me today. It's more a case of, um, you know, over what what area do you do you install? What are your type of, of um, a producer that's buying um, that type of, of device? If you go to something like a smart tag or, uh, you know, um, a multiple device installation, and you want 100 and they can supply you with 10, um, maybe they're not quite in the space that, of maturity in terms of, of supply. So um, you should get a, a pretty intuitive feel for someone that's a startup and someone that isn't, but um, doesn't mean startups aren't worth trying. That's not what I mean, but you know, I guess the greater confidence, the thing with this stuff is you need it to, to, to contribute in a consistent, accurate manner. And the longer they've been in the business and the more mature their solutions are, the more likely that will be the case. Yeah, excellent. That's some, some good advice there. Um, that's excellent. We haven't got any questions coming through on the chat, but if anyone does have any questions asked afterwards, I'll be sending out um, all the contact details for our presenters today. So feel free to um, contact them directly. So thanks, Darren, I appreciate your time. No worries. If we could jump to the next slide, please, Kylie. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, introduce our, our first round of panelists. And if uh, Dan and Anthony and um, David could raise their hand with the, um, little raise hand function down the bottom so that uh, Kylie can, can spotlight you. Um, oh, there we got Anthony, yep, great. If we can find Dan and, and David Ward, that'd be awesome. Um, so um, we're going to have uh, five minutes each with a couple of slides from those three presenters and th then we'll have a chance for a, a Q and A after that. Our first presenter will be um, Dan Winson. Dan's, uh, the founder and CEO at Zetify. Zetify installed some uh, rather extensive Wi-Fi networks across our uh, pilot farms on all our sites and also surveillance equipment. Second will be Anthony Chick from um, OptiWay, who's a business development manager there. OptiWay, um, we had two OptiWay units, uh, one at Canamble and, and one at Angolong. We did plan to have one and then and move it between the three sites, but um, I don't think the Canamble site wanted to let it go. So we did have to get another one, which is great. And it's a mobile in paddock uh, cattle weighing system. And then David Ward, uh, regional manager based out of Dubbo for Goanna Ag. Goanna Ag uh, uh, providers of telemetry and sensor systems uh, uh, across um, Broadacre and cotton irrigation industry. So Dan, if uh, you want to kick off, Kylie, and we'll Jump to the first slide with Dan, please. G'day. Um, yeah, Dan Winston here from Zetify. Uh, we are focused on building Wi-Fi links for farms and providing connectivity into key locations. So we don't do sensors. Um, we essentially build systems that allow people to get their phone working. So speaking of pain points, as, as Darren was just a moment ago, um, if, if people have got yeah, slow internet, if they've got poor phone connectivity or poor data connectivity around the farm, um, that's where we come in. So basically we use small towers to provide big Wi-Fi networks across vast distances. And farmers are using this in the first instance to have better connectivity for their phones, better connectivity for iPads, better connectivity for, for whatever they really need to get on the internet themselves. So it's great to have all this data um, driven by your IoT system into the cloud. But if you want to be able to use that data, you need to have a solid internet connection. So if you've got 4G right across your property, you don't need us. But 66% of farms don't. 66% of farms have got pretty terrible phone coverage. And that's why there's a big market for what we're doing. Um, so next slide, please. 
this is what it looks like, um, both in the trial sites and moving forward, the sort of systems that we're deploying. So we've, we've done more than 100 farms now. We've got 10 people working for the team and we've received extensive support from the investment community, from the government in bringing this technology to scale. So we've been very fortunate on our journey so far and very appreciative for the support we've had from DPI in, in progressing this. Um, we start with the obvious, the low hanging fruit, the simple stuff, getting, um, yeah, getting your, your house, getting your shed, your yards, your workshop, getting those sort of areas covered so that where you're spending a lot of your time, you can have some Wi-Fi and get that immediate benefit. And of course, where you've got Wi-Fi, you can start plugging other things into it. Things like, let's grab this uh, to show the sort of cameras we're dealing with, not toys. Um, this is the sort of thing that James has got on top of the, uh, the shed at Angulong and you can see a kilometer away quite comfortably with that. Um, but then progressing from there, uh, things like having precision ag and telematics um, and, and full property wide coverage is something that's achievable in a lot of cases, not all cases, like if you're on a cattle station, sorry, we still can't give you full coverage, but what we can do is provide some key locations where, so you don't have to drive quite as far to get a phone call out or, or to have a look at what's going on via a camera. Uh, last slide. So our key product um, that was developed it largely through the lessons learned in this project is the Zeti Rover. So that's shown on top of the on top of the ute there. So this is the current version of it. The new version's actually got a GPS built into it. Um, Rob Tuck made it clear that he wanted GPS coverage. So we're upgrading his uni unit and sending that out. So I think it's already left. Uh, so that he can do some uh, GPS monitoring. But the important thing with this is it provides Wi-Fi connectivity around your vehicle. So if you've got a tractor that supports Wi-Fi via the screen for precision ag, or more simply, if you've got a phone that supports Wi-Fi calling, um, both on and off farm, this device can provide you that Wi-Fi connectivity for data and for Wi-Fi calling. And um, we can fill in the gaps using your on-farm Wi-Fi infrastructure so that you can also have cameras. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we're building and deploying. Uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to, to work with DPI on this. It was a really successful project and looking forward to doing more of it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dan. That's, that's great. Very high level uh, overview. As I mentioned before, uh, Dan's contacts along with everyone else will um, be in a follow up email. So feel free to, to get in contact with the suppliers uh, directly after this. If we want to jump on to Anthony from OptiWay, it'd be awesome if we could spotlight Anthony and awesome. Morning, mate. Thanks, okay. Scott. Okay. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so OptiWay was um, was uh, developed by um, Bill and Jackie Mitchell in just north of Armidale to to basically um, cover off a need for in paddock weighing, which has been a void in the in that space for uh, for many years. So um, initially, they were looking for a system that was both accurate, reliable, um, fully um, mobile and are able to be moved from paddock to paddock, um, mob to mob, et cetera. And also something that didn't require um, any animal training or you know, entrapment or, or fencing or, or further infrastructure. So um, sort of after, after five or so years of um, development and research, um, they, they developed the, the OptiWay unit, which is the front foot um, weighing system that it, it weighs the front feet of the animal and calculates a total body weight um, based on an algorithm. Um, so it was commercialized in um, 2019 and we now have, um, well, in fact, last week we delivered our 50th unit to um, just close by here, which is, which is really great. Um, so I think um, the next slide there, Kylie. So uh, the DPI pilot program has been really great. We've had, um, as, as Scott mentioned before, we've had, we've had two units, one at Angolong and one at um, Canamble, and they've, they've, they've come with their challenges and, and, and also um, you know, substantial insights and learnings, which have been really great. The, um, I guess the main, the main challenge that we sort of identified from the, from the Angolong uh, unit was uh, the sort of inability to have um, a shared SIM type um, connectivity where we've got a property that has, uh, you know, Telstra, Telstra signal, but a better Optus signal and having the ability to have a dual SIM type um, connection option has proved very, very difficult, even though it sounds uh, simple. And, you know, you have to go overseas to get 
um, SIM providers, and that's um, that's proved to be unreliable and and um, inefficient. Uh, so little things like that, and then um, I guess um, from the from the point of view of benefits, we've we've had both emotional benefits and also benefits that have helped us um, develop the product. Um, you know, around those misconceptions on um, front foot weighing, um, you know, its accuracy, its reliability, um, and and things like that. And then in terms of emotional benefits, we've actually had uh, users, and Scott mentioned before that um, the guys over in Canamble are very, uh, don't want to see the unit go because the, the whole family has kind of got involved with the weighing process now that was something that happened very rarely and was and was uninteresting but now it's kind of a, a daily um, a daily event and everyone gets excited about how the cattle are tracking and there's a little bit of accountability around um, you know what's what are they doing to move the cattle why aren't they getting fat today etc cetera, etc cetera. so so those emotional benefits that you know are unexpected are sort of flowing in and it's been great to see that um, so from the point of view of um, the, the unit itself, I guess the initial um, the initial benefits of saving time, uh, labour and fuel costs by not having to muster and weigh and yard cattle have kind of been over overshadowed now by the the profit driving benefits of um, you know monitoring uh, weight gain on a daily basis, monitoring paddock performance, um, and also. Um, the key drivers of targeting your exit weights um, and reducing grid penalties and those sort of things have really come come to the fore. Um, where and 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 so we've had some really great um, you know results in terms of in terms of that. So moving forward into what's happening next, Kylie. Um, next slide. Um, sort of the roadmap for for technology are our um, and and Darren mentioned the the, the need for you know, good quality um, data um, um, display, um, you know, reliable information, all those things that make the tool useful are, are things that we're constantly working on and improving. And so our, our roadmap will be sort of around those enhanced, um, those enhanced reports and analytics and so on. And I guess with new technology, you discover um, uh, new um, issues and also uh, benefits that probably didn't exist before prior to the technology. So in that respect, we're, 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 we're getting information that needs to be um, displayed or, or analysed in different ways. So that's part of the ongoing um, development from that side of things. There's, there's great opportunity in, um, in the sort of rollout of better um, uh, you know, low-level satellite type technology with SpaceX, et cetera, to then improve the, the data upload capabilities and, and the add-ons that the product can, can have um, in terms of visual um, um, equipment and, you know, further monitoring equipment and things like that. So the, the future is exciting in what can be added to it and the, and, and the greater level of information that can, can come to it. So, um, yeah, so all in all, the... The, um, the, 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 the process with DPI has been really great and um, we've really enjoyed um, the, the relationships we've had um, with, with the product. So thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony. It's been uh, yeah, exciting to work with a relatively new piece of technology and get some great feedback from the participants in the program. So appreciate your time. Thanks, we Scott. jump on to the next slide. Thanks, Carly, and, and bring Dave Ward up. So I'll just introduce Dave Ward from Goanna Ag, uh, based out at Dubbo, and kick off with you, Dave. Cheers. No worries. Thanks, Scott. Uh, firstly, thank you to Scott, but also to the three families involved in uh, in the project. It's, uh, it's been great to get to know them and see their country and, and farms and management. So it's uh, uh, it's been, uh, been a good experience. Um, Goanna has been around for about uh, a bit over 20 years, practical and commercial uh, and research experience. Um, one of the sort of statements we stand by, I suppose, is what if your farm could talk to you and, if you, and, if, and you understood what it was telling you and, uh, and what those understandings would do to improve your farm business. Um, we're uh, leading 
irrigation scheduling business in the uh, in the cotton industry um, have been now for, for some 20 years in Australia and we're just expanding out into the US. So the big focus on that is obviously saving, saving water and growing more efficient food and fibre. Uh, our solutions in Q include, which is probably our, our signature product, is our GoField uh, soil moisture probe for irrigation scheduling. Uh, and that's layered with NVDI, NDVI imagery. Um, we've now got some new canopy temp sensors and, and all the analytics behind that to have uh, uh, real-time irrigation scheduling decision-making in the hands of those, uh, those farmers. Uh, the other part of our suite of products is our GoSense range. Our soil moisture probes are connected to our uh, extensive uh, weather station network, which is some um, close to 600 weather stations across Australia now, uh, our rain gauge network, temperature humidity sensors. Uh, and in addition to that, we deal with, I suppose, four main factors is soil, water, uh, weather and inventory. So we have uh, tank monitors, uh, we have channel and storage um, uh, sensors to, to show where volumes and, and levels are up to of of on-farm water, and then obviously measuring rain and uh, and weather in in that in in near real time uh, right across your your farm. Next slide, please. So the learnings and the challenges uh, from the Smart Farms project is. I think firstly we need to both understand the problems that we're trying to solve and get a clear understanding of that. Uh, there are lots of dynamics, I suppose, in, in people's management, their level of connectivity, uh, the robustness needed uh, of these devices, and obviously having the uh, uh, localised servicing and support of these devices, because uh, it's a fairly robust and rugged environment out there that we're dealing with. So uh, the reality of these, these sensors are, uh, um, are needed. So what's important to you uh, and what's your budget? You know, there's a lot of data out there at the moment. Is it meaningful data? So it is as simple as knowing the height of a tank and knowing the height of a channel, knowing the weather on your local farm, knowing what rain has occurred on, on an outlying farm or on a, on a contracting place where, you, where you've been working. Um, they're all learnings and challenges that, uh, uh, that we're trying to, uh, trying to solve. Um, one of the big things, and I think it's come out a little bit as well uh, from some of the other other trials around is aligning expectations and what is what is the reality. Um, we spend time with our clients. Uh, we try to understand uh, what value that, we, that, that they're wanting to get out of this, um, what savings uh, and what returns that they actually need. So part of that is to continue building our capacity uh, and supporting. Um, a lot of the devices, as, as all of the suppliers would say, most of them are not set and forget. There is a level of maintenance that's actually needed. So there's some learnings that need to occur with the, with the, with the farmers, with us as well, in regards to what the limitations are, where those things are. You know, Scott mentioned bird damage, livestock damage. So guarding is very important and matching that guarding, for instance, with, the, uh, with cattle or sheep. Uh, you know, a tree guard might do for sheep, but it definitely will not do for inquisitive cattle. Um, so we really do thank, thank the farmers for their feedback. Uh, we look forward to working with them more. Uh, it helps us build better capacity um, and, uh, and, and allows us to meet their, their expectations uh, and, and those into the future. So next slide, please. So our, our, I suppose, big take home for the roadmap ahead for us is we want, we want to make these devices simpler, smarter and a lot more efficient. Um, we also want to, you know, change the language. You know, it isn't ag tech that we're in. This is actually best practice farming uh, and best practice management for food and fibre production. Uh, we want to match your needs uh, to what's available. Uh, we want to align ourselves with, with other, uh, other suppliers uh, to fulfil those needs. Um, and we want to get that right data in the right place uh, at the right price, you know, ongoing fees Annual fees is definitely a point of, connect, of contention for people and having that round value so that people can make better decisions uh, for better management, better productivity, and overall, better profitability out of there. So, you know, overall that data must be solid and it must be reliable. Um, so thank you, Scott. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, 
we've got a couple of questions coming in, but before we uh, jump onto that, I'd just like to um, flick a question back to, to Anthony. Um, and that's uh, really around, uh, I think one of the main questions a couple of our participants came up with is uh, what was the best lick block to use on the uh, OptiWA? Obviously uh, it uses an attractant. And um, yeah, if you've got any insights into that, I think that'd be good for everyone on the line. Yeah, th thanks, Scott. Look, this is a this is probably fundamentally the, um, the 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 most difficult thing that we have to deal with in terms of um, getting the animals onto the unit. And, and you can either you can you can go both, you know, two well three ways. It can be uh, highly attractive, and you get just a flood of animals and and uh, and they and they sit on there and and guts it, or you can get you know fewer animals. But so it's a balance of how uh, I guess uh, the requirements and the and and what makes something attractive to that particular animal in that particular location. And and we found that um, you know animals up north might be craving um, molasses, but have salty water. So a, so a molasses block with salt in it, they don't like, even though they like the molasses. So. It's really a case of trial and error, and I guess understanding the the trace element and the, and the nutritional uh, requirements of, of the animal in your particular location to best um, find the attractant. Um, Bill and I always say that you should be getting sort of upwards of between 100 and and, and to 200 visits from an, from animals a day, and of that you might have 80 to 100 individual animals um, would be a would be a good start we've got guys getting 250 300 animals a day um, you know from visits a day from from 150 animals and then we've got others who are getting uh, you know 20 30 uh, and less or less but it um, it does depend upon the 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 concentration of the animals in the paddock the the um, you know whereabouts it's situated is it near somewhere where they like to relax uh, is it near water is it near a feed source those sort of things all contribute to how effectively the animal is attracted onto the device um, so it's not a it's not set in stone and it's really a case of knowing um, knowing the environment and knowing what your cattle crave at any given time. So it just involves a bit of uh, local farmer research and development themselves to, to find what works for them. Exactly. And the, and, the, and the more you involve yourself in that process, you know, the greater results you have. We've got people that, you know, don't really, they're, they're, they're happy for, for the animals that go onto the unit to go onto the unit without, with, minimal, with minimal contact. And then there's others who really drive that process and get and get um, you know lots of data. So it's yeah, it's a it's a two way moving um, moving street. Excellent, thanks, thanks Anthony. Uh, Bron, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, there's a question for Dan. Um, do you think you could help facilitate the video streaming of livestock auctions on property? Um, the person that asked this said that he often hears from auction providers that it is often impossible, too laggy to achieve this. Um, Did you yes. get that, Dan? Yep, got that. And yeah, okay. we already do, actually. We've been doing a lot of work with Auctions Plus and, uh, and they're talking with the various other uh, stock and station agents and others that are involved in the uh, on-farm auction process. Obviously, with COVID, there's been a lot more demand for on-farm uh, auctions and on-farm connectivity in general. And um, there, there will be places where it's impossible until Elon Musk gets his stuff together down in the Southern Hemisphere. Once that happens, we'll be able to do it everywhere. But uh, in the short term, it's possible in most locations, um, including locations where you've got zero connectivity at the yards or in the location where you're holding the sale. Typically what we do is set up a temporary mast on top of a hill and then uh, beam a Wi-Fi signal down into that location to provide the connectivity that's needed. Uh, interestingly, often those temporary masks end up being permanent once the farmer realizes the benefit of having that connectivity in that location. But, uh, but yeah, we, we can help with that. I'd suggest people just reach out and ask if they want any help with that sort of thing. So Dan, what's the most unexpected benefit that our, that our clients found after they've set up one of your Wi-Fi systems? 
unexpected benefit would have to be, and I'm not saying this is a good idea, and in all cases, there's probably a better way of doing this, but something that we didn't anticipate was that people can use the microphones inside the cameras to actually hear whether a pump is running or not, and farmers' ears are well tuned enough to actually know if that pump's doing what it should be just based on the sound. So that was certainly unexpected. Wow, <laughs> that's neat. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Dave Ward, I've just got a, a quick question for you. Could you give a bit of insight around the most sort of commonly requested sensors and tech that people are looking for? And does that differ between, say, irrigated cotton and, and dry land farming? Yeah, well, the irrigation side of things obviously is led by, I think this year we've got six, 700 soil moisture probes out uh, being, being installed at the moment. Um, the water management on the irrigation side from telemetrizing their pumps to know that they're running, how much water they're pumping, channel heights uh, and dam volumes and, and heights is, is very important with, with legislation changing. So they're probably the key things from an irrigation from all farmers. The weather stations are definitely um, uh, proving to be very popular for, for their own spray and EPA um, management uh, and also probably a, a, a sideline to that is you know the neighbours know that you've got a, a certified weather station on your place now all of a sudden off target spraying almost finishes overnight which is a fabulous thing for the industry and and production full stop um, yeah and the rain gauge side of things is is really expanding at the moment people knowing that what rain has occurred uh, variably across their farms uh, and also uh, on, on outlying places. And then the obvious one with livestock water, um, whether that's once a day or in real time, um, the, the savings and the peace of mind uh, that occurs from knowing that the tank's full um, or at a critical level and they need to, to know where to, to run off to, to to fix a problem. So. There's probably a snapshot of of the uh, uh, of the solutions that that are out there and the popularity of those products. Excellent. What what sort of interest have you had in the new um, satellite backed rain gauges? Because if obviously with with satellite connectivity, you can stick them anywhere in your property, and in with the, you know connection with a, a full weather station somewhere else on your property, you can get a pretty good view of what's happening in your rainfall and weather across a larger area. Yeah, look, I think, you know, it was it was mentioned at the beginning of the of the presentation that um, as far as, you know, reaching those or meeting those expectations. And I think, you know, even a channel, even a, a stock water uh, tank sensor that measures once a day, that saves you one trip a day out to that area. And if, you know, you're in a remote place, um, you only get there once a week to know at least every, you know, two, three times a day that that tank is it has adequate water in it for those livestock. Um, is just such a peace of mind, um, and yeah, that that would be that would be definitely uh, a big kicker for people. I just saw one last question pop into the chat um, for you, David. Do, do you have two-way pump control as well, or is it just one-way sensor data? No, all our devices are two-way. So, um, um, but we don't have we don't have pump sensing um, or monitoring at this stage. It's just. Um, Weather, water, soil, okay. uh, and inventory at this stage, yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank our first three panellists. Um, if we can jump to the next slide, Kylie, and if we could have Sam and Brian and Pascal raise their hands so that um, Kylie can find them. I'll, I'll introduce um, Sam, Sam Fishers with ICT International. Um, ICT provided... Um, both telemetry and sensors to our, our three locations. Uh, Brian Thompson from Porosity. Um, Brian provided um, soil management um, sensors and um, pump monitoring um, at our narrow mine site. And Pascal Hendricks is with uh, Farm, FarmBot, product development manager there and um, provided remote water monitoring systems across our three uh, sites as, as well. So we'll Kick off with uh, Sam first, if we could bring Sam up. Thanks, Sam. Morning, how are you? Morning, Scott, thank you. Uh, g'day, everyone. Uh, Sam here from ICT International. We're based up in Armada. Just a quick thanks to all the, uh, the producers and um, Scott and DPI, and uh, probably a thanks to um, 
uh, pear tree for uh, the patients in ingesting data from the various data sources, which was a bit of a headache to start with, but we got there in the end. Um, all right, I'll jump to my first slide, thanks. Uh, so a bit of a history ICT uh, business was started by Peter Cull back in the late 1970s. Uh, Peter did his PhD in irrigation scheduling in cotton and really introduced uh, quantitative soil moisture measurements to agriculture in Australia. Um, and that really set the context for the business for the, the next 40 years to come. It's uh, identifying these key physical parameters that are essential, um, essential in growing a plant and measuring them and quantifying them and controlling them. Um, so Peter demonstrated through the 80s uh, massive yield gains and productivity improvements that can be made through just measuring soil moisture. And soil moisture, as David said uh, a moment ago, is one of the, the key parameters that's still measured today. Um, Early 2000s, uh, ICT moved from importing these uh, instruments from uh, the US and Europe uh, to, uh, and moved to manufacturing uh, uh, sensors that were not really being produced by these other manufacturers overseas, but uh, which are essential to uh, addressing these scientific questions um, uh, around growing a crop. So we made a sap flow meter and a stem psychrometer, stem, uh, uh, commercializing research that had been done by uh, the University of WA and uh, Guelph uh, University in Canada for those instruments. And the stem psychrometer is still the, the only instrument that'll measure real time uh, water potential um, uh, today. Um, and then, so for the previous 10 years with all the, the um, uh, first range of uh, loggers we brought out, it was all a proprietary 2.4 gigahertz. Three years ago, we got sick of uh, uh, working with that protocol and the limitations associated with it. So we moved to an IoT platform and uh, the, the ICT logo really encapsulates what we uh, focus on. It's uh, plant, soil and uh, atmospheric sciences and bringing the practical application of these into growing a plant. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in this trial, we put out some weather stations, uh, soil moisture stations at Canamble and Blaney, um, some NDVI sensors, canopy temperature, uh, frost sensors at Narromine, where they're gonna put in potentially an almond crop. Um, uh, and some plant monitoring at uh, Angalong, uh, been some uh, dendrometry, sap flow, uh, leaf wetness for uh, disease modeling and uh, BPD. Um, so that's uh, what we've put in. Uh, we've, I mean, Blaney's uh, more in line with uh, where we're really focused in the horticultural sector at the moment but um, Canamal and Narromine are more the industries we've come out of and worked in over the last 40 years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ICT's roadmap for the future, um, really moving uh, and listening to the customer and the, that's where the customer is gonna tell us where the future is. Um, uh, I mean, uh, collaborating with other technology providers. Um, so. The, the benefit we've seen in the shift to IoT is not so much the sensing. We've, we've measured these parameters for, for the last 40 years. Um, it's in the connectivity and the, um, uh, the collaboration that's offered by moving to open protocols. So now we've moved from a proprietary 2.4 to full agnostic. Uh, where we're really a hardware focused company and we'll collaborate with any other hardware providers, integrators and software companies like Pear Tree um, to deliver an end solution. Uh, um, so we'll collaborate with, the collaboration is uh, key to getting where you need to go, I think, um, and not siloing yourself in your own little world. Um, 
uh, so it's collaborating with your customers, collaborating with other uh, uh, industry uh, industries and other um, companies within those industries, and really continuing to do what we've done for the last 40 years um, and leveraging our, our domain knowledge um, within those sectors. So we're, we're as much scientists and um, uh, agronomists as we are electrical engineers at ICT. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. If we could move on to the next slide. If anyone's got any questions for Sam, just drop them in the chat as, as we go. Um, and I'd like to introduce Brian Thompson from um, Porosity and Brian, handing over to you. Thank you, Scott. Um, all right, well, thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get into my slide there. The slide. And uh, so, quick company overview. Um, we're very experienced in the ag tech uh, industry. Um, we were established in 2007, so 13 years ago as a company. Uh, it comprises of myself. Um, I'm the founder of, um, actually, there's just a, there's a little bit of disorder on some of those slide. So if you just, yeah, bring up that one there, then thank you. Uh, I'm the founder of Porosity and, and mainly focused with the product development and support uh, of our offerings that we offer to our customers. Um, about 19 years experience in the ag tech and dealing with sensors, telemetry and software. Um, which I pretty much will start after my ag science degree at Sydney Uni. Um, I'm a farmer. I've got 600 acres at, uh, just north of Golgong, near Mudgee. Uh, I think that's really important to have some practical insights into the day-to-day -day, you know, uh, runnings of a farm and, and how this technology fits into that, um, certainly from a supplier perspective. Um, and father of three kids. Um, Fraser is, is, a, is a business partner now. Uh, he's mainly involved with uh, the technical and IT support. He's got over 30 years of experience in this ag tech uh, uh, industry um, from his early days back in the 1990s, running around with a neutron probe uh, irrigation scheduling service in the Lachlan Valley. Uh, he's got both bachelor and masters uh, behind him and a father of a couple of kids. Um, and we've got about 750 monitoring sites now across New South Wales. That's a big range of industries in viticulture, cotton, dryland farming, uh, environmental monitoring. Um, so one of the one of the our big focuses is on using really high quality uh, hardware, and we're and we're really big on support. Um, the if you just uh, flick up there, yeah. So we just understand how that that flow on effect from investing into really high quality sensors does lead to more reliable data and information and then the smarter farming decisions that come, come in after that. Um, next one there. So the one thing, and, and I heard this popping up quite a lot today, but you do get what you pay for. I, I, you know, the old saying that um, if you buy it cheap, you'll buy it twice, uh, couldn't be truer for this sort of technology. So don't just, um, don't just go for the cheapest option when you're looking at a long-term solution. Um, we've seen many suppliers come and go over the over the 20 years I've been involved, um, and that's typically been on the back of um, companies trying to use cheaper cheaper sensors, cheaper telemetry, which just couldn't be supported in the long run. So um, then the uh, yeah the support is just absolutely paramount. It's it, it it ensures that the systems keep going for years and years. We've got weather stations that we installed 25 years ago, so before I even started that are still going today. And it's because we've been able to maintain and exchange sensors if they need be, um, even having, even getting microchips repaired on, on the main board of our telemetry units. Um, we are a small little business, as you can see, just myself and Fraser, we've got a, we're, we're backed with, with a really good support from our suppliers, um, but we do offer really personal and um, personal service to our customers who we deal with directly. Um, and we personalise that service that we provide. Just keep flicking up there, on the things there. Um, Agile, yeah, we just we're, we're fairly hardware agnostic in terms of what we what we offer our customers because we can um, go to new suppliers as we see fit. Uh, it means we can we can keep um, changing and, and moving with the times as there's been a huge explosion of new options on the market. And, uh, and yeah, we just really value having those long-term relationships with those customers. 
So the pilot project uh, that we've been involved in here um, is, um, is uh, just click up there, that some of the challenges, certainly COVID um, caused some interruptions to our uh, supplies and delivery of hardware. Um, the customization of every site uh, is, is a really um, important one, I think, that end users need to consider. Um, the brief was to have three soil moisture monitoring sites and, and the two pump sites at Narromine. Um, just on that, on the three soil moisture monitoring sites, um, we've got about 600 odd um, soil moisture sites around New South Wales. But I can say that every single one of those sites is unique. They're just, there is so much variation between, you know, every vine block, every soil type. Um, and on this, this project, you know, we just had to make sure that we get that probe in a representative spot. Um, you know, understanding are they disc or time when they're planting? How deep do they go? Um, you know, where are the wheel tracks going to be? Um, you know, if you're spraying that paddock every every few months, then you know that there's a wheel track going to be 13 metres out from the fence line, another one 15 metres out from the fence line. You don't want to probe under the wheel track because it's not going to be representative. Um, the two pump sites at Narromine were very um, were, were very variable. Um, they're just, you know, huge variation in terms of monitoring different channel heights, different channel depths, different diesel motors, different different pumps, um, different flow rates, and just being able to integrate our sensors and make sure that we're matching up what, what each site is is uh, is doing to make sure that the that the monitoring was effective. Um, and every site is different, just like every soil on every paddock and every fence line is different. Every farm is different. Every farmer is different. Um, you've just got to be able to customise your products, I think, to be able to ensure that the monitoring system is most suitable for each, each end user. And some of the learnings, um, we've got, yeah, obviously a lot of other suppliers there doing their thing. It's been really interesting to see the ways they've um, solved some of their monitoring challenges. The connectivity options, it's already been pointed out a few times, um, but obviously there's the, the two main options really. Um, as far as I see, uh, setting up your own wireless network with something like LoRa, LoRaWAN or Wi-Fi, uh, or utilising some of the existing connectivity options that are out there, such as Telstra's Cat M1 network and satellite. Um, just get the facts for yourself. Um, my my uh, research into the Telstra Cat M1 network, I think I was a bit sceptical when I first saw the coverage maps of New South Wales and uh, pretty much all well, every dead spot between every 4G tower is now covered with Cat M1, but our testing is proving that, that we do have really good Cat M1 signal in all those areas where we have previously had no reception. Even at the site there at Angulong, um, you know, Fraser, when he was installing that system, couldn't make a phone call for nearly five kilometres close to the site, um, but, but the Cat M1 telemetry unit that we've used is sending data in every hour without a problem. So have a look at that when you're doing your research. Next slide. So the roadmap, um, and just uh, just flick down again. The, the headings didn't come up there with the with the points. So we're just going to continue to filter filter the um, the the re our research into new products and and telemetry and software. Just making sure we're offering um, the right products to our our customers and giving giving our end users good value. Um, we understand our role. That that is our one of our big roles. Is, is um, that's our specialty. We've been using this technology and we've been looking at it and working with it for so long. And I think that does provide value to end users who are very busy doing what they do best. Um, some of the hardware uh, roadmap is we just want to continue using really high quality gear. We don't want to be um, lulled into using cheaper, cheaper gear, which then gives us headaches down the track. Um, the modularity of, of telemetry units, I think is important. The LoRaWAN telemetry unit that we use actually has a little chip in it that can be swapped over to a 4G or a Cat M1 modem later on if you need to. So I think that's important, not having to replace entire systems um, as things like telemetry systems evolve. Um, just working with existing connectivity, I think is really important and, and certainly something that has very reliable communications. Um, the integration and uh, Tweaking, not twerking. <laughs> Very different meaning. Though. Okay, <laughs> I can see Clive Palmer um, doing some twerking, but um, 
Don't let that. Uh, okay. Um, don't 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 think of Clive Palmer. Um, think of the tweaking uh, that we can do with with the systems, the uh, the sensors and telemetry, and just continuing to offer that high value support. Um, you know, we'll be making we, we continue to make sure that we answer the phone and fix a problem over the phone, or um, or get on site if we need to be there to uh, to repair cables if they have been damaged or hit by a spray rig or whatever. Um, you know, we're, we're generally there within a few days. And um, company evolution is we'll, we'll continue to grow with our customer base as we as we need to. Um, we'd like to do that organically and sustainably, and not relying on you know things like venture capital to grow really quickly and and uh, um, just continue to to offer that very high quality service to our customers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the time and thanks, Scott, for for the opportunity to to present today and, and be involved with the project. Thanks, Brian. That was that was great. Some good good insights there. And um, yeah, if we could bring Pascal up, that'd be great. Thanks, Kylie. Good morning, Pascal. Good morning. Hi. Over to you. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Farmbot is an ag tech business focused on providing cost-effective, innovative monitoring and control solutions to agriculture with an initial focus on all things water. We use the latest technology to deliver systems that have a low cost of ownership, maintenance free, and the ability to adapt to changing user needs. The creation of our products and services is driven by real customer needs and designed to cope with the twin realities of bad connectivity and current rural familiarity with technology. Our products are simple from the user's perspective. They're easy to install, easy to use, and do not require expensive technicians. We appreciate that to be successful, great technology is not sufficient. We need to provide a fully service solution. The long-term plan for Farmbot is to be the remote eyes and ears of the producer, bringing back information to provide additional insights into their systems and operations. Next slide, please. For the pilot, we provided level sensing for tanks, turkey's nest, bore, and diesel. Rain gauges were also provided for each tank. The FarmBot monitor is the core of all these sensing solutions and use either satellite or cellular communications to transmit the data to the FarmBot web platform. This is a proven technology with nearly 3,000 monitors employed across Australia. All the monitors in this pilot use satellite communications, which allows connectivity all across Australia. This pilot demonstrates to producers that remote monitoring in areas where traditional connectivity is limited or non-existent is now commercially viable and most importantly, reliable. And I believe this has been a success of this pilot. Though our cellular version has lower communication charges, you are guaranteed to have a reliable connection if you go with satellite. Another key aim of ours is to provide complete end-to-end -end solutions out of the box with simple installations by the end user with available tools. This can be a challenge as it's one thing to provide a box with a probe and another thing to have versatile mounts, attachments and fasteners to handle a wide range of situations. It's always useful to see how producers use what we provide. With every bit of feedback, we can continue to improve our offerings to be as much of an out-of-the-box solution as possible. There was another talent challenge of providing end-user install solutions. Due to COVID-19, there were delays in getting some specialty sensors to the producers, and as a result, some of the bore-level monitors are yet to be installed. The producers have had limited time and resources to allocate to this, which is totally understandable, especially with the effort of pulling up the pump for the bore-level installs. I appreciate your efforts with these installs so far with the pilot. The bores are currently installed and are already yielding insights into the recharge rates of the bores. And it'll be very interesting to see the state of the water table as, it's water table as it gets hotter, to learn the behaviors of the pump, as well as begin accumulating historical data that can be used in further analytics for years to come. Next slide, please. On the left of this diagram, we have our core range of sensors, water level for tanks, turkeys, nests, large scale dams and bore, as well as rain gauge, line pressure and flow. These can be combined on a single monitor to service a range of monitoring requirements, such as tank level with flow meter on each of its outlets, pressure downline of a pump combined with flow, or even bore level and flow. The roadmap for 2021 brings satellite connected pump control and camera with trials beginning in the next month. In the end of the day, we are 100% focused on the customers and are always on the lookout for new ideas for development. Additionally, the FarmBot monitor is also a wireless base station. Each can support a range of sensors that utilizes the satellite backhaul of the monitor. This is achieved by using a LoRa radio for its long range and low power, but using our optimized communications protocol. 
Unlike LoRaWAN solutions, which require large expensive base stations and the correct frequency, the LoRa, the FarmBot LoRa protocol communicates only with FarmBot monitors and sensors and is not held by the LoRaWAN restrictions and the need for local gateways. This creates additional value by reducing the upfront and communications cost of each wireless sensor and expands a bubble of connectivity where you need it. We are close to the soft launch of a new product, the wireless trough sensor, which will be the first step in the development of the FarmBot wireless sensor ecosystem. This will provide an opportunity for third party sensor integration, such as soil moisture, to operate within two to five kilometers of any monitor. Anyway, we live in exciting times. Thank you everyone involved in the project. I look forward to working with you in the future. Back to you. Great, thanks Pascal. I, I like the idea of um, the, the ecosystem you're, you're talking about. If you have um, uh, with the new ecosystem platform, how many troughs or other sensors can you have working off one base station? Uh, at the moment, we have up to three troughs, but we're looking for cellular and with uh, other satellite ones, we can potentially have five to 10 Excellent. based on its communications backhaul. So, so just a random left field question, where's your most remotest device in the country or overseas? Uh, oh yeah, okay. So we have a few in America trialing, um, but I believe in the, the dead center, there's a place called Sandover um, I think that's the most remote place in the Northern Territory. Awesome, that's great. Excellent, any other questions on the, on the line there for anyone else? Um, yep, there's a question here for Pascal. So um, Tim has said, nice work on the farm bot ecosystem. However, is the farmer charged per ping of the sensor to the satellite? If so, can you give a guidance on how much this might cost for a tank sensor? Okay, so um, what we do is we have a subscription card for the monitor. So for example, if you have a satellite monitor, we provide with on, on top of a tank that does just tank level, we have a subscription cost for that of, I believe it's $456 a year. So it's about a, a dollar and a bit a day. Now, if you have an additional wireless sensor, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, about a dollar a week uh, for each additional wireless sensor. So it's just built on top of that initial initial satellite backhaul. So we just, we've already paying the data cost for that original thing. So we can just piggyback, you know, multiple wireless sensors on with that. So it's a, it's a lower cost. Excellent. Thanks, Pascal. Um, thanks to Sam and Brian as well. As I mentioned before, I'll be sending out their details to uh, everyone after the event. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to uh, contact them directly. Um, yeah, so thanks for the three presenters and we'll move on to the next panel. Thanks, Kylie. If we could have uh, Daniel, Jamal and Hamish raise their hands so that Kylie can pick them up. So I'd like to introduce um, Daniel Ryder for, from Movement. Movement provided uh, cattle GPS tracking, uh, so little tiny um, solar powered GPS ear tags, which work on a um, proprietary LoRa network, uh, which we had at our Canamble site. Jamal provided um, some satellite tracking, which we were looking at at, at Narrowmine with several devices. And um, Hamish Munro from Pear Tree. We asked Hamish to provide uh, an integrated dashboard for all of our data because we had so many different suppliers and different sensors, we wanted to make uh, life as easy as possible for our, um, our collaborators uh, to bring all the data into one, one spot. So we're really looking at more um, putting the focus on the sensors and the, and the data. So um, over to you, thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much, Scott. If we can go to my first slide, please. Thanks. Okay, I'll, uh, sorry, Scott, the one, yeah, that one. Okay, I'll start with a quick overview of our company. Movement started in 2017 within Rabobank when four employees won an internal innovation program. Um, after that, the development of our tax took a few years and many mistakes, but we are now a fully commercial company since the beginning of 2020. And we have a commercial GPS ear tag that is single prong, weights under 30 grams, is reusable and lasts for five years. We now have our main office in Brisbane CBD 
and we have another office in the Netherlands and we have customers in over nine countries, but our main focus, our main countries of focus are Australia and South Africa at the moment. I would say our, our main point of difference is that we offer not only hardware, so the tags and the LoRa antennas, but we also offer the software side to access the information sent by the tags and it can be accessed by any iOS or Android device that is connected to the internet. Um, we made the installation process of the antennas, I would say easy enough so our clients can install, can install our antennas themselves if they want to. However, we also partner with an installer in case the producer need a hand with installation to make it easier for them. Uh, this installation partner and ourselves offer full customer support. Now to our tags, our tag, on our tags, you can record important information about the tagged animal like the NLIS or the visual ID number, the type of the animal, this being a bull, a cow, a steer and so forth, the age, breed and the paddock the animal is assigned to. If the animal for any reason leaves the, if the leaves the farm or the paddock it is assigned to, a notification will be displayed on the app. Our tags, our tags do send a new location every hour through radio frequency to our lower antennas and then to the cloud and to the producer's mobile device. So as, as long as the producer has access to the internet and has his mobile device with him, he can monitor his cattle regardless where he is, even if he is um, if he is overseas. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I guess uh, the main challenge and learning from this pilot is that the location of the antenna is key for our tags to perform. Because the system works in line of sight, it is very important that we place the antenna at a strategic point where it can see the whole farm or at least the area of interest or where our tags are going to be. Usually the best spot for the antenna would be a high point and centrally located on the property, although that's not always the case, but we can work on that. We offer uh, free radio maps to see um, where the best location is to place a single antenna or if it's a bigger farm, if we need to place uh, multiple antennas on it. Uh, so in this pilot, we had some tags that although they sent our tags and a message every hour, not every message was received by the antenna. So when, the ta when, when a tag, when an animal is in a black spot or so to say, meaning a location where the antenna cannot see the tag, that single message is lost. But once the, the animal comes back into the reach of the antenna, the new messages are received and new locations of the animals are displayed on our app. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now our, our roadmap. Um, before, before the end of this year, we are, we are introducing the web portal. On this portal, producers will not only be able to track the animals in real time, but to trace back as well in time, allowing them to plot grazing patterns like the image on that slide. That's on the farm we were tagging. Uh, grazing patterns can give them a better understanding of how efficiently their animals are grazing and make the produ and make the producer and the produ and give allow the producer to make changes to the paddock sizes if necessary, so the animals can graze more efficiently. Another feature will be to trace back a single animal's movement for, for let's say the last 24 hours or let's say a week to see how much they are walking each day. Um, I guess this is a, a especially good feature for bulls, for example, to check how much each of them is walking compared to each other and to see if they are actually chasing cows doing their work or if they are just being lazy. Uh, so the portal will allow to plot graphs and compare how much each bull walks every day, is walking every day. 
And lastly, we are also working on adding accelerom accelerometers to our task. With the accelerometer, our system will be able to detect certain events like cattle running away from wild dogs, calving events, mating events, and so on. But we are expecting the accelerometer on our tax to be available on, I would say, second semester 2021. Um, so, yes, that's the time frame we are working on. Um, working on this project was uh, because when we started tagging on this farm was on very, a very, uh, very early stage. I would say it was a very good learning experience. And obviously we are very thankful for the opportunity. Opportunity, So thank you very much, Scott. And back to you. Thanks, Daniel. That was, that was great. I'm sure there'll be a, a few questions. Well, there's already questions coming in, which we'll answer, uh, we'll ask them at the end. So if we could jump on to Jamal, thanks, and, and bring her up. Morning, Jamal. I'd like to start Hi. with Jamal, uh, who's with Pivotel, uh, who work with satellite uh, technology. So over to you, Jamal. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. Now, um, we did join the project a little bit late, and um, I guess I started with Pivotel this year. I've got over 20 years experience, but starting this year, um, so we sort of uh, we, we put forward a tracking solution, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, we do offer a lot more than that. We're an Australian owned company. We're one of the four mobile phone carriers. You've got Optus, Telstra, Vodafone, and you've got us, Pivotel. Um, we, we concentrate on regional Australia. So we've got more than 100,000 connected mobile satellite services and uh, over 135 staff now. So we've branched into New Zealand, the USA and Indonesia. Can I have the next slide, please. So we're 17 years old. So Pivotel, um, we carry voice and data over our network. Now we've got um, base stations in Dubbo, in Mount Isa and Mekathara. So it, the, the satellite is landing here in Australia. Um, so we've also got uh, something different to the other carriers when it comes to your satellite phones. We, we provide an 04 number, which is an Australian mobile phone number. So if someone was to ring you, it's a free call if they've got unlimited calls in their phones, um, phone bundles. So that's something very different. We don't have any special dialing plans either. If you need to make a phone call, you just pick it up and dial like you would any other mobile phone in Australia. So that's one of the really big points of difference with Pivotel. And we're not just satellite phones, as I said, we provide a whole lot of um, other things specifically at, at the moment, data seems to be a very big focus and you know, the ag tech is something that we've been working on for a few years. We've got a model farm in Armadale that we're working on with the UNE. And they've, we've also done some projects where we've had, uh, it's Mount Barker and Wikipin. We've got 50 farms connected on something called Ecosphere, which is we set up, we literally go in there and set up 4G networks. Um, and very, very successful. And I've got some case studies on those if anyone's interested. So you know, if a whole group of farms were to get together there or um, areas, we can definitely work on building solutions like that. And then we also build e ecosphere for one farm. Um, for example, the University of New England, we've got that model farm going now and we've got a whole lot of um, towers or one tower and a few different antennas around the place. And then they've got 4G SIMs in their devices that are back calling over NBN satellite through us. So we provide all of that. Not the next slide, please. <laughs> so what we did for this trial is we actually, um, I put forward the spot trace, which is something that's more of an anti-theft solution that um, we provide and that we've got a portal called Tracer Track. So all of the information on where your, where your assets are can be located on this portal. You can have hundreds and hundreds of them, or you can have six of them. We also have personal monitoring. So a lot of uh, the spot devices and the enrich devices that different people use for personal safety, I guess, um, can also be viewed on this portal with, with your assets. So it's one portal that covers a whole range of different products from different providers. Now, um, I guess the challenge with this was that I provided this um, equipment to be used um, for anti-theft because that's pretty much all that was left available once I got um, introduced to Scott. 
Uh, we do provide some of the other um, types of solutions. Um, we also power FarmBot. So they're our satellite um, sims that are going through FarmBot. We, um, Rob wanted to use it to track um, his kilometres on and off road. So that's not what I sold the product for, but we had to think outside of the square and come up with a way that we could do this. Now, one of the issues I found was if I had known it was to be used for tracking, I would have suggested that we have a cable cable um, put into it so that it was powered by the car, which would give you three years of battery life. You wouldn't have to be replacing the batteries all the time. So I guess one of the things that I've learned from that is, you know, asking more questions about with the actual end user because I, I and finding out exactly what they want to use a device for. It might not be what we intended it to be used for, but if we, we had have asked a few more questions up front, I think we would have been able to um, be a little bit more successful and not have to change batteries so often. Um, we could, we would have also did two and a half minute ping intervals rather than five minute, which is how we had it set up. And I think um, what in the, one of the other successful parts of it was the ability that um, if you didn't want to use our portal, you didn't have to. In this in these circumstances, we had an API and that information went straight through to Pear Tree and they were able to put it on their dashboard. So next, please. <laughs> Next slide, yeah, great. So the future of Pivotel, I guess, um, all we focus on is regional Australia. So that is who who our customers are. It's where we are. It's where I spend most of my time, except for when I'm locked down with COVID. Uh, we've got a lot of connected vehicles. I guess one thing I didn't mention is we're pretty agnostic as well. We choose which satellite provider is the best for the situation and the problem we're trying to solve with you. We have Inmarsat, Thorea, Iridium, Global Star, and we've got a few others we're working on or with at the moment to bring into the mix. So whether it's machine to machine, um, backhaul that you're after, whether it's just a sat phone, whether it's tracking, we will go, we will discuss it with you and we'll work out the best solution that suits you. It's all customizable. Every single farm is different. Every single person I work with is different. Every person that uses our products wants something different out of it. So it's a really customized approach. I should also mention um, we're our, you know, our all of our call centers and supporter in Australia. So it's up on the Gold Coast. So you've got 24 by seven support. A lot of our future is, um, I guess we're looking at dual SIMs and failover. There's a lot of um, stuff that we're doing in that area. We um, have something called PAT that's being released soon, which is Pivotel application to talk and text where you can fail over to satellite. Um, we've got Ecosphere, which I mentioned, which is basically setting up your own little 4G network. We have high bandwidth connectivity with real time feedback. We've got low range for IoT, low latency, and we're just constantly working on different different satellite solutions and bringing different satellites into our mix. One of the other things that we're working, I've been working on a fair bit is the connected vehicle where we put the antennas on the roof of um, some vehicles. And one test I did recently is they've got failover from 4G straight over to the um, satellite sim, which has worked really, really well. And we've just driven all through Goulston Gorge and some really um, sort of hilly areas where you, you're not expected to get connectivity. It wasn't perfect, but, um, you know, it can work in different terrains. So we will pick the satellite solution based on your farm and whether you're in valleys or whether you're on flat land. And um, again, NBN is also something that we um, provide, which is the um, backhaul for a lot of uh, your monitoring of different different systems and services. And that was pretty fast. I tried to get as much in, so I'm sorry if I talked really fast, but we do so many different things. Um, I'd be happy to consult with anybody that wants to have a chat with me. Um, we've got like over 45 engineers. We've got, we've got about 105 staff in Australia, 45 of them are engineers. So it's That's all great. about, yeah. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks, Jamal. Some, some great insights there from, uh, from the pilot perspective, but also into the yeah. use of satellites. Great. Uh, great. Thanks, I'd like to welcome uh, Hamish Munro. So, uh, Hamish doesn't provide connectivity or sensors. Hamish uh, at Pear Tree provides an integration dashboard, which we chose to use basically to take um, the software side out of it and focus on, on the data and the sensors and, and the benefits of that for the growers. But we also 
got some uh, great benefits out of working with Hamish and Pear Tree. So over, over to you, Hamish. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Firstly, yeah, I'd like to thank New South Wales DPI and also the three uh, families and cooperators for this business, uh, for this project. I think um, we've learned a great deal out of, out of this process. Um, and actually out of the three uh, different dashboards to each individual, individual business, we also then created a fourth, which uh, Scott and New South Wales DPI and the stakeholders within it were able to oversee a, a shared overview as more of a corporate type view as well. So I think that's quite important about the, the data, data sharing with permission that, that we can uh, do for farmers if they, if they need to um, share data uh, either between properties or between farming groups or between um, consultants and things like that. But it is all with permission and, and the ownership of the data is, is always with a farmer. So as it says there, we, what we're trying to do is simplify your day. So we're trying to sync all of your farming data into one view. And we achieved that particularly within this project. Uh, we had nine different uh, suppliers. Uh, so the guys that were here today, unfortunately we didn't get to um, uh, integrate with the movement guys at the moment, but certainly would love to and have already integrated with, with another number of other uh, GPS tag tracking uh, companies, uh, so we can certainly certainly uh, bring the likes of movement on board uh, when they're ready. But we also um, have brought in Cybo Labs for the Angulong property and also the um, Canhamel property, and then also pushed um, specific data back out in a sharing view to Think Digital uh, to enable the um, the other two videos that you may have saw last week or that Scott published uh, earlier this week that the um, the device management component of the Think Digital uh, videos, uh, augmented reality, is in real time and driven through Pear Tree, enabling all of these uh, providers uh, plus the, the other 70 that we have on board already. Any of that data to be uh, then pushed to um, the likes of of something where you could have wearables into the future. So we're already starting to to get uh, your farming ability to to be uh, at that level of uh, decision making when you're when you're driving around your your property. You can you can have a look. But what we're doing today at the moment is really about data centralisation, and it's really about having aggregated views so that the uh, if you do for many various reasons actually have a number of tanks across your property, particularly because of uh, connectivity issues or something like that. You may, may be able to um, uh, have to, to change networks and things like that. Uh, we, for us, a tank's a tank. So we can just put a number of different tank providers on the one platform or the same with um, different soil probes or weather stations. And then what we do is then look at that data geospatially so you can see the spread of uh, where the rain has fallen across your property and things like that. So that's how we do the data uh, centralization component. Um, what we try to do with all of these guys is that we, uh, uh, these great providers here within Australia and some of them international, is really complement their data. So we're not aiming to uh, compete against it. They're the experts in irrigation scheduling or um, scientific level uh, type uh, measurement of, of specific things for different industries or something like that. So what we do is utilise their data and then put it with other data to enrich that data to improve decision support that farmers need now and further into the future. So being agnostic, any network, uh, whether it's 3-4G, satellite, uh, LoRaWAN, SigFox, um, CATM1, MBIT, Wi-Fi, uh, or any other way uh, data can be transferred, we can connect to any supplier and any device type. So we, uh, within the project, we had uh, 52 different devices but of those 52 different devices, there was 99 sensors attached to that. So we um, are collecting all of that data every day. Um, and at the moment, Pear Tree is probably collecting half a million records across all of our different uh, pr uh, properties that we're managing at the moment um, every day and storing that, that data appropriately. Um, but what our ability to be agnostic as well as agile and, and flexible from our farming background is that it provides farmers with 
uh, the ability to be flexible uh, and have a wider choice to actually, uh, <coughs> excuse me, identify the devices that um, specifically going to add value, as Darren said at the start, identify what is going to be the low hanging fruit and what's going to work for you. Um, and then build and uh, out something that's going to work for your business. And that's where Pear Tree can enable uh, you to go on your own journey and select from these or any other provider that, that has their data digitally connected uh, and we can, we can then um, align everything for you. So the benefits, what we saw of, of this project specifically was really about the engagement Talking to three different industries um, was a bit of culture, uh, broad acre grazing and cropping, and also the cotton guys, um, <coughs> excuse me, to um, really engage and just see different industries, how they want to see data and, and, and the priorities that each industry really has. Um, but it also allows us to, to for us uh, as a business, normalisation is the key for, the, and the difference between rubbish data uh, and, and good data and so part of what our service is is really spending a lot of time normalising uh, even simple things like the time you know sometimes uh, things are uh, on local time sometimes they're on epoch time which is a sort of a global standard type time or sometimes they're you know sort of daylight saving and all of that and those little things uh, we map out to make sure that everything is always the right time for the right time uh, frame on your on your property so that if you're in hopefully in Bali one day or, or France you can actually still have a look back and see what's happening on your farm in the correct time um, but then also the combined views are really important for us you know sort of for us to charge a subscription on top of the existing subscriptions that these guys are charging we really need to create a real value proposition so that we're saving a lot more time and giving you a more consistent and reliable view, view of your property rather than having to juggle between all of the, the different apps that the suppliers have. Now, the suppliers apps are really important in the fact that for you to drill down or manage the alerts or manage uh, the do devices specifically, you still need to have those, um, those apps. But for the combined view and then also for where we're going into the future, the converged uh, decision process of having uh, the humidity coming out of a weather station driving disease modelling or, or driving uh, evapotranspiration so that you know when to, to think about uh, irrigating or, or scheduling irrigating and things like that. All of that sort of stuff, we can actually overlay all the different algorithms from a, a suite of different devices um, uh, within, within Pear Tree. Um, and so that, that data convergence is really important where we're going with our roadmap, but also we want to take that, uh, all that data and allow farmers to actually look at it at a paddock level so that your um, how you would expect if you were going to benchmark your property or uh, things like that, you want to know how much rainfall was within that paddock for that crop. So we look for devices within a paddock or close to that paddock to give the, the closest uh, rainfall amount that were, that's possible uh, rather than having a guess from what was received at the house, which may be a number of kilometres away. But flipping that on its side, we can then also look at that from an enterprise point of view because those paddocks will be then nominated uh, for beef production or, or uh, cropping or, or cotton or, or viticulture or whatever. So we can also then have a bit of a look at that. So um, yeah, probably the only, only other challenge that we have from Pear Tree is really about getting a base map, um, which I think is important for any farmer really to have a digital base map now uh, and make sure it's nice and clean that the paddock uh, boundaries line up because that will be your source of truth going into the future uh, and being able to understand exactly what the size of that that paddock is and then also you know what um, productivity per hectare per mill of rain uh, comes off that that paddock so yeah thank you very much scott um, my details are there and certainly for anyone please reach out and we'd love to um help you manage your data thank you thanks hamish that's uh, that's a great overview and sorry everyone we're running uh, about five minutes over time so um, we might hold those questions and um, I'll shoot those through to the, the individuals and get some get some answers back. There's some
great questions. I think we probably could have kept going with uh, Q and A and um, some more discussions for another half an hour or so, but um, probably need to wrap it up. If we could jump to the next slide. Thanks, Carly. Um, thanks to everyone who uh, presented today and for the input into the into the pilot projects. That was uh, a really good. I think we all learnt a lot. Um, suppliers and ourselves and our collaborators. Um, it was a, a really good journey and hopefully that will continue. Um, I'd just like to highlight that uh, we do have a Farms of the Future digital resource page, which went live yesterday. Uh, the links to that will be in the, in the follow-up email. We will be posting all of these webinars onto that site once they're signed off, but we already do have um, all of the videos we used. If you jump to the next slide, thanks. Carly. All the videos that we've used during the webinar series are up there already and we have the links to the, the farm XR and the virtual farm experience. So uh, jump on there, have a look at those, have a look at those sites, have a look around. Um, yeah, and everyone's got my details. If you do have any questions going forward, but yeah, please just contact me by email or give me a call. That would be that would be great. So thanks uh, everyone, I uh, appreciate your time uh, and sorry we just went a little bit over, but I'd, uh, I'd like to close out now and um, yeah, thank everyone for their participation.